Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's world's most exciting classroom event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. We are in a new location, which is always exciting. So if you've been following along, we've crossed the Atlantic. We just spent some time last week in Fernando de Noronha, and now we have made it to Salvador on the coast of Brazil. We have another big group of Darwin uh, 200 leaders in Salvador working on projects. We have all kinds of great stuff going on in the field, and we have a jam-packed event in store for you today. Now, before I start bringing in some of our live guests, I have a little video clip here of the journey uh, from Fernando de Noronha um, over to Salvador. So let's bring that video clip up, and let's take a little look at that. <music> So there we go, some great footage of uh, the Ushurskalde at sea. Uh, those incredible, that pot of humpback whales, absolutely amazing. Uh, and then there we go, we are in Salvador now. So the first person I'm going to bring in with us today uh, briefly is Josh Clark. He is uh, on the Ushurskalde. We met him last week in Fernando de Noronha, an amazing cameraman. And we're going to catch up a little bit uh, on the crossing. So let's bring him in now. Hey, Josh, how are you? I'm all right, thank you. How is everybody? Good, good. It's great to have you with us today. So you were just in Fernando de Noronha. Which project were you working on? I was working on uh, the project about invasive species, particularly this big lizard called a, a tegu that's uh, damaging the turtle and the seabird populations over there. Okay, so my guess is it's going after the eggs then, or maybe the babies too? It, it, yeah, yeah, both, but mo mostly the eggs, mostly the eggs. Okay, and what kind of kind of programs do they have on the go? Are they trying to eradicate them right from the island? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're trying to wipe them out because they don't, they don't belong on the island at all. And there's nothing there that, that preys on them. Um, so they just keep on, keep on producing. I think there's 15,000 or something on the island now, which comes down to 570 per square kilometer, which is crazy numbers. Okay. Wow. Um, all right. Well, so that seemed like a very interesting project. We'll share that Darwin uh, leaders uh, videos when we can. So from there, you had a little jump uh, on the Atlantic to get to Salvador. So we saw a little clip there. Can you tell us about the, the crossing as you headed over? Yeah, yeah, the crossing was great. It was my first time sailing on a ship. So uh, the first two or three days were spent um, getting used to the, the motion of the ocean. Um, but once everything settled down, it was nice. We had some, we had some dolphins on the first day, but we knew we were going to be sailing through humpback whale territory. So everyone was really just on the lookout for the whales the entire time. And on the last day, Salvador was in sight and we sort of settled on the fact that we weren't going to see the whales. That it wasn't going to happen. And then all of a sudden, about two hours before we arrived into the city, with the skyline of Salvador in the background, we saw humpback whales fin slapping and tail slapping on the water. Um, so the captain was nice enough to turn the boat around 
and we went and caught up with them and we flew the drone up in the air and eventually we were at one point surrounded by humpback whales we didn't know what direction to look in because there were so many whales around us it was amazing oh it sounds incredible can you make a guess how many do you think there were well we saw uh the, the pod that we filmed there were at least seven in that pod because we managed to film seven at once um but there were at, at least i would say three pods around us so i would say anywhere upwards of 15 whales around us at one point oh, absolutely amazing so you know we saw a little footage there with the drone kind of being captured as it came back to the ship does that get easier with time or is it always still kind of nervous launching from a moving uh and then capturing from a moving vessel it it does get much easier the first time we did it it was a, a very touch and go we uh we ended up it, it was a bit of a struggle getting it back on the boat and we ended up crash landing it with a with a okay. teeny tiny bit of battery left um but we learned a lot of lessons from that first time we flew it and now uh me and Nico are like a, a well-oiled machine. We're a, we're a good team when it comes to flying the drone from the boat now. Everyone's quite impressed by how how easy we make, we make it look now. Excellent. So um, before we let you go, there's a couple things I want to share with those joining us. We are going to share another Darwin 200 liters video uh, in the call. We'll probably do it a little bit later, and we're going to share one from Cape Verde this time. Uh, but if you do have any questions for Josh about life on the ship, Now's the time to use the comment section uh, on YouTube. We can squeeze one or two in. And then we have Madame Better's grade six is hiding backstage. Let me bring them in here for a quick wave. Hey, crew. Do you have any quick questions for uh, Josh about the humpback whales or sailing on the ship or just being a cameraman on board the ship? Any questions? No, no questions yet. All right. That's okay. We're going to bring you back in a little bit later after we have a few more guests. Okay. Well, Josh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm sure you've Great. got a big day ahead of you. Uh, and I have a feeling in our next event when we're actually the next event will be Salvador uh, and then sailing to Rio. So I'm sure we'll see you uh, a couple more times in the next few weeks. Yep. I hope so. Thanks, Joe. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. We'll see you soon. Bye. -bye. All right. So now I'm going to bring in our expedition leader, Stuart McPherson. I told you it's jam packed this morning. He is on a boat and they are making their way to the mangroves. So we have a project, a leader project taking place in the mangroves uh, and they're on the boat right now. I can see Stu there backstage. So I'm gonna bring him in with me. Hey, Stuart, how are you? Hello, Joe, it's lovely to speak to you. We're calling live from um, the Bahia de Torres Santos near Salvador in Bahia, uh, Brazil. We're actually on our way to study some mangroves. There was a big petrochemical sk spill off the coast of Brazil um, by a Venezuelan tanker a few years ago. And the team here, the research team, that are on our boat here, are going out to study it and to see what the impact of the petrochemicals have been at those years later. They've been doing a long, long-standing research project. So we're not there yet, so we'll, we'll present the reports and findings of what we, we find here next week. However, I'm just going to pass you over to three friends. They're going to tell you about an amazing project that they've undertaken. To, uh, to, to collect microplastics. So here we go. Hi everyone, my name is Antonio Rocha. Hello everyone, my name is Genilson Brito. Hello, my name is Pedro Dantas, and we are part of the Cafeína team. We are from Salvador, and in the, the year of 2019, we participate at a global challenge proposed by NASA. There is a hackathon called NASA Space Apps Challenge, and we are global winners from this year challenge. This this year in March we we went to NASA. We visit Harvard, MIT, and a lot of these cool places. And we back in Brazil, we made a doc, we shoot a documentary, and we are gonna stream it maybe in December or in the early early 2024. And you guys are probably asking what take us to NASA and why we we did it to win this change, challenge. So there are many challenges that NASA proposed in the competition, like fire in the forests, uh, go to Mars, go to moon, and also challenges for the ocean. And we choose the ocean challenges and more specifically the microplastic problem 
and we develop a dispositive that can be coupled to vessels and platforms. And since the boats go straight away all day, every day for the whole year, many, many years, they could help us to clean the ocean. And also the ocean currents contribute to put the plastic in the same place. And we can put something there to also get this help from the ocean currents. So we developed this system that you can couple to vessels, platforms, and also put in fixed floating points in the ocean. And the water comes in and we filter the black plastics and then they are, the water continues cleaner. To know more about our project and our team, you can follow us on Instagram in searching like a equipe Capitalina and we love to talk more about our project. And we are also really pleasure to be in this streaming yeah. because last week we spent the week traveling in the Osterskelder with Josh and the whole crew. It was an amazing experience and we have to match this program. They are creating leaders all over the world to make difference and inspire people. And here in Bahia, we have this most really important activity that we did in, we do in our university and in the schools to empower the Brazilian youngest to become problem solvers, to create solutions to the environment. And for sure, we are doing here a job that really have something in common with the Darwin 200. So we are really pleasure to be part of it and hoping to be in the Darwin in America. We don't know. And if you have any question, you can shoot here in the comments that will be answered. If uh, Stuart give us to us, but uh, it was a great experience, and I hope it, uh, you you can get any of experience of, of the NASA or, or any marathon of technology and things like that. It's a, a very, very nice experience, and it's wonderful. I think Joe is... All right. Guys, hey, Joe, nice to meet you. Yeah, you guys too. Congratulations. That is so exciting. Congratulations on your project. I have no doubt... Uh, that you guys are, are going to continue doing great work around microplastics in the area. It's very exciting. Thank you. Um, it's really important for us to have this live with you. And Stuart was telling us how this class works every week and how many schools are together all over the world. So it's a great stage for us and really an uh, honor to, to can talk here in the so all right well let's let's ask let's ask oh hey Stu, let's ask you a couple uh, questions before we let you go and the first one being about that ecosystem behind you can you tell us a little bit about the mangrove ecosystem here sure so we're, we're in coastal mangrove forest here today oh sure that's got louisa um we're in coastal mangroves it's only just starting so it's a um a saltwater bay and the mangroves are appearing just up here at the estuaries of the rivers. So we're going up one of the big river systems here. And yeah, if you can see here, this lighter color in front of the palms, this is the mangroves. So now just starting. So when um, we've been sailing, well, motoring for about three hours to, to get here, and they're just beginning now. So um, we're gonna film them today and look at some of the projects and the conservation work that the teams are doing. Then we'll show that to the, the, the world's most exciting classroom next week. We'll edit together a special video all about that next week. Excellent. And Stu, why are the mangroves such an important ecosystem? What services or jobs do they provide for us? They are incredibly important here. Well, for many reasons. Ecologically, the nursery areas. Mangroves have really complicated root systems called prop roots. And um, this creates an immense range of habitats that, uh, that animals, particularly fish, uh, rear their young in, the mollusks and, and many other animal species. Um, so they're very important for the ecosystems. Also for humans, they're the buffers. When big storms come in and storm surge, they protect the land. So they're important for nature and important for people. So they're very, very, very key. Obviously, they, they, were, they were severely impacted by that huge petrochemical spill, about 100,000 tonnes of oil 
and petrol were released off the coast of Brazil. And it drifted in and coated the coasts of the country several years ago. And it's still here today. If you dig a hole, you'll see it oozing out of the ground. So the researchers on this boat are looking at that and looking at how the mangroves are responding and the ways in which the, the ecosystem can bounce back from that petrochemical impact. All right, Stu, I don't know if one of our, our microplastic friends is close by, but someone yeah. here is wondering uh, oh. about... That's a microplastic question. Yeah. yeah if, there, if, now, the micro, if the plastic maybe, are having an impact on the, the ecosystem, on the mangrove, if plastics are having an impact. Plastic having an ecosystem on the uh, impact on the mangrove ecosystem is plastic. I'll let Luisa answer because she is searching on this. Okay. Okay. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Good morning. I am Luisa. I am from a group from Federal University of Bahia. So could you please repeat yes. the question? So are plastics or microplastics impacting the mangrove ecosystem? Yeah, this is a emergence topic uh, about the pollution in mangroves and there are new research about this, this specific topic that the, the scientists in the university is trying to help to mitigate this pollution. So I think... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, because of those complicated root systems, mangrove acts like filters, not just for biomaterial, but for plastics as well. So they often accumulate a lot of plastic, particularly plastic bags and so forth. So that's a big... All right, excellent. We'll get one more question for you. Oh, I think, oh, there we go. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit about what research looks like when you're in the field? What are you doing when you're in the field? So it's a good question. Here we have some projects that are specifically in the mangrove ecosystems. So we do the monitoring about uh, the variables that impact the of PAHs that are carbons that uh, impacted these ecosystems. Uh, so we have we already do this monitoring about many parameters about these ecosystems, like pHs, salinity, organic matter is an important variable. So we do the monitoring mainly after an oil spill. So when an oil spill accident, to the better this cool. oh, I think we might. Right. so Stu, i am going to bring in our next speaker but before we go uh if you want to join us later if you get closer to the mangroves we'll bring you back in again and we'll maybe we'll chat a little bit more if there's still time sounds good thank you so much thank you thank you Thanks cool. for joining us, team. Have fun out there. Thank you. All right. We'll see you soon. Okay. All right. So we uh, had a connection with the ship. We just went out onto a smaller vessel in the mangroves. They're making their way out into the mangroves to work on that project and with the leader on board. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about Brazil and the Atlantic rainforest. And I'm really excited to have uh, my friend Leo Lana joining us. Leo is an amazing biologist. He's an amazing photographer. He's a National Geographic explorer. And with uh, any luck, I'll be seeing him in Rio uh, in a few weeks. I'm going to bring him in live right now to talk to us a little bit about the amazing insect species that he studies. Hey, Leo, how are you? Hey, Joe. How are you? Hi, everybody. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, it's great to see you. It's been a while since we connected. I think last time we chatted at least face to face was in the Azores and that was a lot of fun. Yeah. So it's great to, to yeah. see you here now. Yeah, thanks for having me also at this event for Darwin 200. It's great because my work is a bit connected to where Darwin has been. I work in the Atlantic rainforest on the coast of Brazil, but in lands, not in the ocean. All right, perfect. Well, I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit because your work, your photos speak for themselves. They're absolutely incredible. So uh yeah if you want to go ahead and share your screen and then of course we'll have okay, some question sure. time uh I and have if a possible, presentation 
Yeah, yeah, I have a small presentation just to share you a bit of our work and what you can find on lands like when you get to Salvador and these areas of the Atlantic rainforest on the coast. Just let me know if you can see it and I can yeah. start. I see it loading up and let me bring it in. All right, Leo, we're good. Okay. So I work with Projeto Mantis, my institution, and we study these amazing insects, which are the praying mantises of Brazil. They come in all shapes and colors and sizes, and we are trying to uncover the hidden biodiversity, which means like we're looking for rare or new species like this beautiful kite mantis from the Amazon. I work with Lucas, who is a graphic designer. I'm a biologist, so we are this team walking in the rainforest. And we do mainly expeditions, scientific outreach, photography, and environmental awareness. So I, I think it has a lot to connect with Darwin 200 and this expedition that is uncovering the coast of many places that ha Darwin has been. So we also bring this cool aspect of science, which is bringing design into it. So we make science to look cool and amazing and appealing to everybody. And we work at night. So uh, usually people are going to sleep, we are going to the rainforest and we find this most teeming, vibrant biodiversity because in the rainforest, in the coast of Brazil, we have the Atlantic rainforest, which is not the Amazon, but it has a similar biodiversity in, in terms of uh, quantity. There's a lot to discover there. And when you go out at night at rainforest, that's when you find most of its biodiversity. And I'm going to share you a bit of our last journey on the Atlantic rainforest, which was Espiritu Santo a bit down from Bahia. The vessel is going to pass by Espiritu Santo when it goes to Rio de Janeiro. This beautiful rainforest, we were there looking for a specific kind of prey mantis, which is the largest prey mantis of Brazil, but it was known only for the Amazon. And we had this team, including Daniel Venturini here by my side. He was at Darwin 200 in Fernando de Noronha filming. He's a documentary uh, filmmaker and we found this amazing biodiversity there so you can see like crazy insects with those open wings all kinds of shapes and colors even butterflies sleeping we find a lot we found a lot of snails rain frogs and all kinds of weird shapes of frogs uh lichen katydids tarantulas which are usual more usual at least in the amazon but there because there's a link to this part of bahia and espirito santo to the amazon a past link they are not connected anymore that you can find a lot of tarantulas leaves that are not leaves they are katydids whose wings are shaped just like a perfect fresh leaf and when they open their wings it has like all of these colors and there we are taking our photos and documenting all this biodiversity, but looking for the praying mantis that we were looking for. So we found a lot of praying mantis there. This is the classic green one, uh, very big as well, but not the largest that we were looking for. We found the stick mantis of Brazil. We found the little brown mantis, which is very tiny. Some were very camouflaged, like the bark mantis. The unicorn mantis, which is unique, uh, in this in South America and it's very beautiful. You can see the little horn that gives its name, the unicorn mantis, the lichen mantis. The first time I saw this one, uh, we found new species like this one is a new species, but it was not the one we were looking for. We found the dry leaf mantis and we spent a week in the rainforest looking for this large one. And by the end, we were like uh, feeling a bit, it was a success. We found all this biodiversity, but where was this big praying mantis? And by the end of the last night at 4.30 in, in the morning, we finally found it. The largest mantis of Brazil, known only to Amazonia, now found on the Atlantic rainforest. So we just discovered the largest mantis of this coast uh, rainforest, the Atlantic rainforest. It's not a known species, so we're going to describe it. It has no name for science, and we are very proud to present this biodiversity that is still hidden. So, you know, like many naturalists like Darwin have been walking the rainforest of Brazil, the coast of Brazil for a long time. And a lot of researchers came after, but it's still there is a lot to discover because the biodiversity is huge. And that's why we have to protect it. That is the reserve. And on the other side, we saw that. So whatever we find land that is not protected, it's hard to keep the forest alive. So we have to keep pushing uh, our governments, our people to protect our rainforest and have them like this. So we can find new species like this one. I just brought it to finish Vatis Phoenix. 
is a species we described in 2020. And this female was only found on the botanical garden of Rio, which is where Darwin was as well. So you're going to pass by Rio and you're going to see the place where this species was discovered in 2020. And this went back to the Museo Nacional, which is an amazing institution this year. There's a lot of new species. All of those are new species of mantis we're still describing. A lot of discover to discover in our rainforest, in the land as well. And in 20 days, we are traveling to Amazon again for this expedition, Mantis Imaginary in Amazonia. So I hope you can follow our project, follow me and Lucas through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, go to our website and keep our work being visible for you. Thank you. And I have a, a guest surprise here. I'm going to stop share screening just a bit. Uh, where do we stop share screen? Yeah, got it. So with me, I have here a small praying mantis for you to appreciate. Can you see her here? She's a bit, uh, yeah. Now yeah, you can absolutely. see her. So all of the praying mantis that we have, we take care of them. So we go to the rainforest, we collect them, and then we take care of them at our home. So we have a lot of praying mantis. You can see here on the back, all of them. And this one came from that expedition, actually, the one from Spirit Santo. It was a little, little baby when we found her. She's a bit suspicious now, but they are pretty charismatic animals. They are harmless to us. So you can see the big eyes. They have a good vision. And they are amazing, almost like a, a pet insect they are amazing animals that's really cool uh leo you mentioned their vision is pretty good so they've got pretty good vision yeah yeah they can see basically like us in 3d and all uh depth of field and everything but the difference is that we see better when images are still so things that are moving us humans we have like a less perception of the, the vision when things are moving. And they see things better when things are moving. That's because they are hunters, so they use their legs to catch uh, other insects, and they hunt live insects. So they can see the moth or the cricket walking by or flying by to catch it precisely. OK, very cool. And so, Leo, if you had to make a guess, because we're always finding more, and it's a big world, Roughly how many species of, of prey mantises have we discovered so far? Yeah, so in the world, we have discovered around 2,500 species everywhere. They are just not in Antarctica and the Arctic. So you can find them in deserts, rainforests, savannas, mountains, uh, boreal forests, uh, tundras, everywhere. Uh, different species, of course, different shapes, you saw it. And most of the diversity is in the tropics. So Brazil, for example, has 10% of this diversity. We have 250 species, but we expect that this number is going to double in the future. So there's a lot to discover yet. Yeah, absolutely. So cool. Uh, all right, I'm going to come back here and let's take a few questions, Leo, before uh, we let you go sure. today. So um, let's see. Let's bring in our grade sixes and see if they have some praying mantis questions for us. I bet they do. They're in Toronto, Ontario. Cool. Morning, Toronto. How are we doing? Oh, uh, good. Um, uh, how big is the biggest mantis that you found in Brazil? Oh, that's a great question. So it was like uh, 12 and something millimeter, uh, centimeters. So it's like bigger than my hand. It's like almost the size of my face. It's very big. Yeah, and it's still harmless, right? So it's just like a big insect, but still harmless to us. One more question. Dara, go really close. Um, how do you get to name the mantises that you discover, or who does? Yeah, when you discover a species, you get to name it. You formally describe it. So you have to find a nice name. So you saw that last one, Vatis phoenix. We gave the name Phoenix. The genus Vatis was known. The species Phoenix is the name we gave because it was uh, in honor of the museum that caught fire, but it's coming back from the ashes. So we give it the name Phoenix. 
And for this big one, we're still thinking about it. Like, how should we name the largest mantis of Brazil? Well, that's a, 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 a tricky question, but we're still thinking about it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Very cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Let's grab a couple more questions here for you, Leo. So um, being in the field, can you tell us a little bit about what your nights look like in the field? Yeah. So when sunset comes, we just start walking. We choose a trail we're going to work on. And then we use flashlights. And we walk very slowly because pregnancies are very camouflaged. So we are looking everywhere for them. On the floor, there are species that are on the bark of the trees, on the leaf litter, under the leaves, over the leaves. So this, we're basically scanning the whole rainforest looking for them. So it can take us like six hours to walk one kilometer. It's not much in walking, but it's a long time scanning all this patch of the rainforest. We go walking and looking with flashlights. Whenever we find one, we take all the data. So like, how is the temperature? Which kind of leaf is, is it living at? Uh, which kind of environment is around? If there's something special around, humidity, all the data. And then we collect it. Uh, we take photos, of course, in, with the live animal. Then we collect it and start taking care. And in a very, very productive night, a very amazing night, we find around like 15 mantis. That is a very successful one. So you can see like in six hours, 15 mantis in a very successful one. It's just, it needs a little bit of patience, but on that way, we see all kinds of biodiversity. So we see snakes, we see mammals, we see even like large mammals sometimes like tapirs or here jaguars. We see all kinds of spiders, insects. It's an amazing work. All right. And so you mentioned they're so difficult to spot. Is that a skill that grows over time? Like, have you found over the years yeah. you get better and better at spotting them? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, uh, we even get unused to. So when I spend a long time out of the forest, it takes me a little bit to start again to gain this expertise. So over the years, now I can spot like a praying mantis three meters from me. And sometimes it's just the antennae out of the leaf. And I can say like, okay, that's a praying mantis. So uh, the eyes get like somehow our brain is very special and the eyes get very trained to that. All right, very cool. And Leo, what are some of the impacts, some of the, you know, the things that are affecting populations of mantises? Yeah, so basically the most harmful one is deforestation. You saw that comparison between the rainforest and the land that was not protected just on the other side of the road. So that's why, for example, we guess this large mantis was not known to science for a long time because most of its land has been wiped out. So they, without a forest, these mantis can't live. There are mantis that adapt like to places that have been deforested, but most of them won't adapt if they are rainforest species. So they are being harmed by deforestation. And then of course you have pesticides because when you have like a forest, but you're applying pesticides just by uh, the forest, maybe it's harming them. This is something that we got to still research, but definitely it's going to affect them. Okay. Well, Leo, thank you so much for joining us today. You're doing incredible work. Uh, I'm really excited for your next expedition. Hopefully we'll be able to catch you before you head out uh, on the next one, but we can't wait to see what you collect, what you and Lucas collect while you're in the field. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Darwin 200, for hosting me. I wish you like the best trip. This is an amazing project and please everybody keep following it because they have like a, a beautiful journey. Next place is Rio where I live. So I'm very excited to follow it. All right. Awesome, Leo. We'll see you a little bit later today. Thank you so much for being with us. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, Leo. All right. So we have come to the time where we are going to do our little Kahoot quiz together. So um, for those uh who don't remember our kahoot we are going to have five questions today some true and false some multiple choice and they'll be based on what we learned today during uh some of our connections so i'm going to quickly share my screen here and let's get in to this kahoot action uh there it is perfect so should be loading up now for everybody get a little bit of volume here if you go to kahoot.it, 
you will find a spot where it's going to ask you for a pin number. So today's pin number is 842-7510. 842-7510. If you are at a desk and you have your own technology, maybe a Chromebook or a tablet, you can join there. If not, your teacher could pop it up at the front of the room for you and you can shout out your answers to him or her. If you're at home, use a tablet or your phone to scan that QR code and it is going to bring you right in. So we're going to have our Kahoot today. As always, our top uh, scoring individual, we will send them a 50 pound Amazon gift card. So take note of the email that I will share after we find out who our winner is. We've got lots of students, lots of classrooms joining us today. That's absolutely great. We've got the space lizard, the creative horse, the, what else do we got? The space pony. Uh, very cool. So we're getting our animal generated names. For each question, you have 20 seconds. The quicker you put the right answer in, the more points you are going to get. And then we will see how our podium finishes with our top three finishers. So it looks like things have slowed down. So I think we are ready to start today's Kahoot. Here we go. We're gonna count us in with three seconds and then we will be live. Three, two, one, and we are going. So mangroves, mangroves are important because they're nurseries for fish. They protect shorelines from storms. They filter pollutants or all of the above. So what are the important jobs mangroves are doing? Nurseries, sh protecting shorelines, filtering pollutants, or all three of those things. All right, good job, crew. It is absolutely 100% uh, all of the above. Nurseries for fish, those root systems they create, are amazing places for nurseries, uh, for young fish. Then we've got shoreline protection, buffering from those hurricanes and storm surges, and then filtering pollutants uh, through into those soils and getting that nice fresh water coming back out. Let's jump to our next question here. The classy elephant is in the lead. Our next question says, Leo is looking for the smallest species of praying mantis. So on his last expedition, is that true or false? He was looking for the smallest species of praying mantis. I can see our answers coming in. True or false? Was he looking for the smallest species of praying mantis? All right. Couldn't fool this crew today. He was looking for the largest species and the way things tend to work on expeditions is you can be out there for a week or two and sometimes everything just comes together right at the end uh, and they were able to find that species. That's absolutely amazing. So the classy elephant is in first place. Let's go to a true and false question. Praying mantises see things better when they are moving. Is that true or false? Praying mantises see things better uh, when they are moving. So they have amazing eyes. They see in 3D like us. We tend to like it when things are, are standing still, but the praying mantis, do they see better when things are moving? All right, absolutely true. And they need that. Insects aren't slow. Bugs flying by, bugs crawling. They have to be able to make a decision and move uh, in a split second to capture their prey. Oh, well, classy elephant does not want to let go of that top spot. About how many species of praying mantises are there? Is it about 100? Is it about 1,500? About 2,500? Or about 4,000 species? So about how many species of praying mantises do we have? About 100, about 1,500, about 2,500, or 4,000? All right. We are correct. Most students went with 2,500. So roughly 2,500 discovered. But Leo was telling us there could be as many as double uh, of that yet to be found in the next few years. So if anyone tells you that there's nothing left to explore or discover, they are wrong. We have so much exploration to do uh, deep in the ocean, in the canopies of the rainforest. There are a lot of things for us to find, plants uh, and animal species, maybe even millions. Ooh, the hero mouse has taken that top spot. We have one more true and false. Leo works mostly at night. 
Is that true or is that false? When Leo goes out in the field, it is mostly at night. True or false? All right, that is true. A lot of species come out at night. There's a lot of biodiversity in the rainforest at night. The temperature's cooler. More creatures are moving around. It's easier to hunt. So the rainforest really does come to life at night. Whereas in the middle of the day, when it's really hot, things kind of calm down. A lot of species are resting. So in the morning, towards the evening, and then into the night, the rainforest really comes to life. So here we go. Let's take a look at our podium. In third place, we have the fabulous squid. In second, we've got the classy elephant. And holding down that top spot, our winner this week, the hero mouse. All right. Good job, crew. I'm going to come back from that screen share now and turn off that music. There we go. And I will share our uh, email for today. So if you head over to here, uh, if you are the hero mouse, ebtsoyp at gmail.com, send me a message and we will make sure we send a gift card to your class. So ebtsoyp at gmail.com. If you don't get it down right now, that's fine. You can check the recording as well. So we're looking for the hero mouse today. And thanks to all the students uh, for playing Kahoot with us. Of course, we'll have another one next week. Okay, so we're going to get to the portion of our call where we are going to take a look at a few things now. We're going to have our brand new experiment. Uh, we are going to take a look at our curiosity of the week. And in between that, we're going to share another one of our Darwin Leaders incredible videos. This time we'll feature plants. The last few weeks we've looked at seabirds and sea turtles. We've kind of ignored the plants, which are so important. The primary producers uh, in the ecosystems. So first I want to start with a shout out to everybody who took part in our experiment two weeks ago. We had a great buoyancy experiment where we learned about sea turtles and Stu from the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth showed us how to make uh, the bottles where we could put our little sea turtles in. And by changing up the pressure, how we were squeezing, we could make the sea turtle move up and down in the bottle. If you did miss that, head over to the YouTube channel and you can find it there. We don't have the results video for today, but we will share that with you shortly. Today's experiment is a really cool experiment about osmosis using gummy bears. So I'm gonna share that experiment with you now, and then I will share how you can send in your answers to the questions over the next two weeks. So let's get that video file loaded, and let's take a look at our osmosis experiment. Welcome back. This week's experiment explores the process of osmosis. This is how water molecules move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. The walls of plant cells have semi-permeable membranes, and through osmosis, this allows the cells to either expand or shrink, depending upon the direction the water moves. This is how the roots of plants absorb water from the soil. But osmosis can be harmful to certain organisms in certain habitats. For example, if you took a saltwater fish, such as a clownfish, and put them in a freshwater environment, it would quickly die. And the same in reverse, if you took a freshwater goldfish and put it in the sea, it would also quickly die because of the osmosis effect on its cells. In this week's experiment, we're going to look at how osmosis impacts gummy bears. To run this experiment, you need three beakers, one with two teaspoons of salt, one with one teaspoon of salt and one with no salt at all. You then need some fresh water, such as tap water, a set of scales, a ruler, three nearly identical gummy bears, and a results sheet, which you can download from the Darwin 200 website. Okay, let's get started. First, let's make our solutions. Pour in exactly the same quantity of water into each of the three beakers. I'm going to put in exactly 75 milliliters into each of these beakers. And the last one with no salt at all. Make sure you dissolve the salt. Mix the solutions very carefully. Okay. 
Make sure you also make a note on each beaker of the different solutions. So I've put a big S here for the solution with two teaspoons of salt, a small S here for the solution with only one teaspoon of, of salt, and no salt at all for the beaker with, containing the pure water. Then you're ready to weigh and measure your gummy bears before the experiment. So use a set of scales and very carefully put on a gummy bear. This one weighs 2.2 grams. I'll put that in front of the no salt solution. This one weighs 2.3 grams. I'll put that in front of the weak salt solution. And this one weighs 2.3 grams. I'll put that in front of the more concentrated salt solution. You then need to measure the length and the width of your gummy bears to see how they change as a result of your experiment. This one is 21 millimeters long and 12 millimeters wide. So make a note of that so you can compare your results afterwards. This one is 22 millimeters long and 11 millimeters wide. And the last one is 22 millimeters long and 12 millimeters wide. So we'll make a note of that too. So they're all very close in weight, length and width. Now put one gummy bear in each beaker. So put one in the fresh water, one in the weak salt solution and one in the much more concentrated salt solution. You then have to leave your experiment for 24 hours. Come back after a day and see how each of the gummy bears has changed. Note down what changes you observe. Which gummy bears have grown bigger or smaller and why? And how does this relate to the concentrations of salt in your beakers? Send in your answers to classroom at darwin200.com or upload your results via our website, www.darwin200.com. Please join us in two weeks and we'll find out the results and the reasons why these gummy bears change. All right, so there we go. There is our experiment. You have two weeks to conduct that experiment in your classroom. Anything that you need, you can find on darwin200.com. You can rewatch the experiment video. There'll be the PDF page where you can record your results. You could also record the results uh, in a notebook, but it might be a bit easier if you print the page and then send in your results to classroom at darwin200.com. And then most important of all, we love to see um, classrooms in action. So do post on social media, post some pictures, hashtag Darwin200 so we can find them. Tag us on places like uh, Twitter uh, and Instagram because we love to see pictures. Uh, of classrooms in action. Now, Stu left out also one of the most important parts of that experiment is make sure you save some gummy bears to eat afterwards. That's a very important part uh, of the experiment, but save at least three so you can put them in those different solutions. So before we wrap up today and we do our curiosity of the week, I promised that we were gonna play another Darwin Leaders video. So this one is from Cape Verde and this one is gonna focus a little bit more on the plant species. So let's take a little look at that. We'll wrap up with the curiosity of the week and then it'll almost be time to say goodbye. So here we go. Let's take a look at um, our Darwin 200 video. When people think of Cape Verde, colorful towns, the fascinating sea life, water sports and beach vacations come to mind. But people tend to forget that life always starts with the small. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm from Germany, but I live in Vienna in Austria. I'm a nature conservationist and Darwin leader. And my project will be about the endemic plants of the island of Santo Antão in Cape Verde. In my hand, I'm holding Lotus latifolius, an endemic plant species of Santo Antão. In the valley behind me, more than 19 endemic plant species can be found. But what is an endemic species? 
A species that only occurs in a limited area is called an endemic species. Cap Verde is a real hotspot of endemic species. But why? Millions of years ago, the archipelago was created by volcanic activity. The first plant and animal species that populated the islands had to cross the Atlantic. Due to Cape Verde's isolation from continental Africa, many new species developed in a relatively short period of time. This makes endemic species to true witnesses of evolution. The endemic plants of Santo Tau are also essential for many other species groups as insects, for example the endemic butterfly species Chilades evore, or birds as the Cape Verde sparrow. Due to various factors, many endemic species are now threatened with extinction, although some of them may not have even been discovered yet. This plant has more luck than other individuals in the area because it grows next to a shrub that protects it against the grazing goats. While overgrazing in this dry area of the nature park is the major threat for the endemic plants, it is also the most important source of income for the local communities. As herbivore mammals were only introduced by the first settlers in the 15th century, they are not a natural part of the ecosystems of Cape Verde. Due to the lack of adaptability to browsing, many species relevant to nature conservation are eaten. The low rainfall on most of Santon Tau creates a landscape characterized by sparse and drought resistant vegetation, which can turn into deserts when overgrazed. This is the case in the Topo da Coroa Nature Park, where thousands of free roaming goats can be found. While most of Santon Tau is covered with these dry, savanna-like landscapes. The northern part of the island appears in a completely different light. The mountain range holds moist air and clouds coming from the Atlantic Ocean, supporting lush and moist habitats. Within the stunning Pole Valley, an extremely rare plant species occurs, Carex antoniensis, which grows in wet soils. While the conversion of habitats into fields used to be the primary cause of the species' decline, Today, it's particularly an invasive plant. The introduced cypergrass species with the local name Goya overgrows the remaining individuals and threatens the survival of the entire species. Today, only a few individuals of this astonishing species can be found in the whole world. In both parts of the islands, ecosystems were degraded and the populations of endemic species are at risk. If no conservation measures are taken, it will only be a matter of time before many species will disappear forever. But the nature conservation organization Terimar, led by Silvana Hock, has set itself the goal of protecting their unique life above the clouds. All right, so a little look at Cape Verde, life above the clouds, and that word again, endemic. So a species found nowhere else on the planet, uh, and that's especially when we're visiting islands like Cape Verde, like Fernando de Neronia, like Tenerife in the Canary Islands. There are species found there that you find nowhere else in the world. They've evolved in isolation by themselves uh, on those islands over hundreds of thousands and millions of years. So another really great uh, Darwin Leader video. They are doing incredible jobs creating their videos uh, and sharing conservation stories from all over the world, wherever the Oosterskelde visits. So we're going to wrap up today with our curiosity of the week. So first we have to take a look at last year's curiosity. It was some kind of strange box that Stu had. I have no idea what it is, so I am looking forward to seeing the answer uh, to last week's curiosity. I asked you to try and guess what this object here is. I have to admit, this is quite a difficult curiosity of the week to try and guess. The answer, though, should be quite familiar to you. Pretty much everyone has one in their home. It's a money box. Believe it or not, 
It's a locked box from about 100, 150 years ago. This particular one is from Asia, but they were made all the way around the world in a very similar fashion and style. You put your coins through that slot there. And there's a locking mechanism on the front, so when you wanted to open it, you could unlock it and then pull out the top, and your money would be in the box. So anyone that guessed a money box, congratulations, you are absolutely right. Well done to those that guessed correctly, and stay tuned for this week's new Curiosity of the Week. There we go, a money box. So we did have a few guesses uh, come in that were right. Lots of different guesses for what that box could store, but the correct answer was a money box. Our next curiosity, I'm gonna play for you right now with a quick reminder that if you wanna send in your answer, you only have one week, two weeks for the experiments, one week for the curiosity of the week. So classroom at darwin.com, if you have an idea of what this week's curiosity is. Let's take a look and see what we think. This week's curiosity is this object here. Can you work out what this is? I'll give you a clue. It rattles. It's got something inside it. Upload your results via our website, www.darwin200.com or email classroom at darwin200.com. Tune in next week to find out the identity of this strange curiosity. Good luck. All right, there we go. Challenge sent out. What is this week's curiosity? Send your answers to classroom at darwin200.com. I have a pretty good idea of what it is, but let's see what our students think that answer might be. So next week, we will be live again, same time, Thursday, October 26th, uh, and it will be at uh, 9 o'clock Eastern, 2 p.m. in the UK. We will still be in Salvador, so we're hoping to have uh, another conservationist join us. Maybe we can beam in from the field. We'll have a Darwin leader join us to share the project that they've been working on. We'll have a little connection with the ship. Of course, we'll have our Kahoot, some time for questions. We'll have experiment and our curiosity of the week. So we look forward to our next event from Salvador coming up next Thursday. To wrap up, as we always do, we have to say a huge thank you, a shout out to our sponsors, to our partners. Without them, this wouldn't be happening. We wouldn't be on the Oyster Scale Day. We wouldn't be sailing around the world following uh, in Darwin's footsteps. We wouldn't be putting conservation videos out to the public all over the world. And we wouldn't be broadcasting live into classrooms. So let's finish off this week with a shout out to our sponsors.